Hi everybody, my name is Danica Joan and welcome to Custody Matters Live. I have a special guest, Catherine McWillie. And Catherine is, has spent 37 years uh, in family law, 24 years was as an LAPD officer who is now retired, 13 years as a child custody and divorce coach. She is the founder of Custody Calculations. She is just, it's a wonderful treat to have her on Custody Matters Live because she's filled with tons of information. Welcome, Catherine. Oh, Danica, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here this. Well, tell our, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, a little background, how it is that you, you came into this work because we all have a story, right? Yeah, so for mine, my story begins a little bit differently because as a young officer, we rarely responded to radio calls dealing with uh, child custody or even divorce matters. They were rare. Well, fast forward 10 years and now Mother's Day, Father's Day, the start and end of all the uh, school breaks, 100% of our radio calls for hours on end were related to child custody and divorce cases. And then, then what happened is we had such an influx and increase in the number of um, homicides, suicides, abductions, uh, child abuse, stalking, uh, violent, uh, violation of court orders, violation of restraining orders, false police reports. And so I, I, I just sort of sought to find out how we could have such a dramatic increase. I mean, for police officers, the worst scenario is always responding to the death of a child. And they, we had several deaths related to children during divorce and custody. And that really um, made it difficult for me to ignore the situation. So I began my own um, journey, so to speak, to really try to understand family law better, to understand what we could do, when and where. and um, that's what began 10 years of research. And it sounds pretty easy when I can describe what some of the solutions are, but it took me 10 years. So it, it was pretty tough and not always easy. You know, I love it that the perspective that you bring is through the eyes of law enforcement. And that's something that we, that I wanted to collect a group of people that do the presentations for the upcoming conference, Guardians and Gatekeepers. I wanted to get backgrounds of, um, so that parents could actually see what's it like through the eyes of a school administrator, what's it like through the eyes of uh, a police law enforcement. From because a lot of times we, you know, they're just surviving and trying to get through this custody battle, and they don't get that all of these different professions are impacted by their circumstance or the other, the family circumstance. And it's always good to know what it's like on the other side, right? Yeah, um, you know, my research showed the impact not only to schools and to hospitals, some of the obvious, but also financial institutions, employers, workplace in the violence, um, violence, excuse me, violence in the workplace, workman's compensation. So it, the, the, the effect of family law is really much greater than people imagine. And now what we're seeing is that some people over the last few years have been released from prison after serving 18 and 19 years on false child abuse allegations. In one case, the gentleman, his release was expedited after his then a grown daughter came forward and said she was coerced into making false statements. But by then, his health had deteriorated, and he died approximately six to nine months after his release. And it's, you know, it's a growing problem in family law. It has been for years, but now it's just, it's unbelievable. It's an epidemic in family law, which is part of my title for your presentation at your conference. It, it I don't even know where to start. I really don't, because... I get that, and I, to be honest, I think that in family law, some of the judges and the attorneys don't even know where to begin. They, they, there's such resignation, um, and they just figure, figure, you know, when, when the parents decide that they're going to stop battling, or unfortunately, if one ends up just sort of squashing the other, then 
everything's solved. And, um, and it's like they forget that these are children, these are future adults that are in, being impacted by all of this conflict. Well, I, I think what we've heard for so many years is the judges saying, see, I told you they would eventually solve the problem. See, we don't see them in court. And really what I want to say to the judges is they didn't, you didn't solve the problem. They didn't solve the problem. They just took it to the streets, to the schools, to the sports and uh, activity locations where the police are responding, where the district attorney is involved, where the hospitals are involved, where counselors are involved, but they didn't solve it and you didn't either. And I really get frustrated when um, I really hear the judges say, this is the problem of the parents not loving the children enough. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. This is really about the courts not stepping in and doing a better job. Now, having said that, let me make one more point. We also have an unfair expectation on our judges. They have to be part fortune teller, part counselor, you know, part uh, who's gonna be the better parent to the children and, you know, and trying to do a good job. I, I do find that a lot of judges and attorneys and counselors do care about wanting to do a better job. They just can't see the forest through the trees anymore. But isn't it interesting, it's my opinion that in all the other courts, the types of courts, it's very analytical, it's very quantitative, it's very factual, they, you know, how everything turns out. And obviously there's attorneys involved that say, my facts are more accurate than your facts. However, in family court, isn't it, doesn't it feel like it's more subjective? It's if I can convince the judge that this child would be detrimentally impacted if that other co-parent, parent was in their life, then uh, I'll win. I'll take it one step further. We do more to ensure the unification of a family with a convicted felon. I'm talking about some violent felons than we do to ensure the relationship between two good fit parents. And that's shameful because we're creating this, this, um, almost sort of like a gene that's being passed down from family member to family member, uh, whether we want parental alienation or parental alienation doesn't exist. I agree completely with you that because we do not enforce the letter of the law, here's what the court order says, here's what they're doing. Here's what the court order says, here's what they're doing. We don't do that. We do you know, not do that. Yeah. And, I, and it, it's like it's like a prize to be won if you fight harder or fight dirtier and the and of course you've got i can't really blame the the attorneys the attorneys are just doing what they've been hired to do for their client and it's their client that that almost like needs a reality check that you get your half but you you're not entitled to the other parent's half and I get that maybe you've decided that that other parent could not do as good a job as you as a parent, but you know what? Children thrive by having a relationship with a parent, whether it, you know, the parent's skills are, are you know, we, have, our opinion is they're not as good as ours. Um, the other point I wanted to make is in Florida, I don't know how it is in California, but in Florida, we have the dependency court. So the foster system runs through the dependency court. Dependency court, uh, they it takes something to get a TPR, a termination of parental rights. It takes quantitative proved child abuse neglect, and then it takes a long time for the judge to finally say terminated. And but because their whole goal is to reunify, put services in place, to build the relationship, um, and it seems like in family court you don't have to be guilty of anything. You just have to be. Con the judge has to be convinced that the accusation is possible. Yeah, I, that goes back to what we said before, which is that we do more to reunify someone who has even had an abusive relationship with their children than we do to allow two fit parents. And, and I will disagree a little bit with you in regards to the attorneys. So my point with attorneys is, and I'll give an example. I had a parent whose child was struggling going to the other parent. And so it became very critical. And I told that parent, you really need to do everything in your power to make sure 
that you affect the change so that the other child, the other parent has the same relationship as you have or the ability to have that. Well, she just, she went and talked to uh, the attorney first um, and the attorney says, oh, absolutely, we can go to court on this. And then they called me back and I said, well, of course the attorney is going to say that, but I'm telling you, no matter what you think that relationship is right now, how bad it is, you go to court and you'll be destroying your family. They, we took on, we took a different uh, counselor. We changed counselors that was, that was recommended because I knew that counselor uh, sometimes who was also a parenting evaluator would get that family into court again, that they would, facilitate the breakup and take one side over the other. Instead, we worked with a really good counselor uh, and the parent called me back and said, what do people do if they don't have someone like you being that calm voice in the background? She says, our relationship has never been better because we're working together for the support and helping our child over these difficulties. And they never regretted their decision not to go to court and their child eventually was just having difficulty like in an intact family intact families we're not perfect you know we don't come with rule books that say oh yes you know you'll never have a problem if you say this or that and so we forget that we've really created a bias for intact families versus uh, divorced families so you're, um, what you do is you coach parents go, who are going through uh, divorce and custody. I'm sure that's a, a, I don't know that parents realize how valuable that really is. It's like you have somebody to hold your hand that keeps you out of the emotional place of, or living in the what if world. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I'll start with the example of child abuse allegations. So some parents someone will say to them, you need to file a child abuse allegation. And sometimes that person can be a counselor. Sometimes that person can be a well-meaning friend. Sometimes it can be a professional like social services. So in one case, social services told my client, you need to call the police department and make a kidnapping report. And they recommended that based on the fact that the child was still not back had not been returned and they were a couple hours late for the exchange. And they called me and I said, absolutely not. Here's what's gonna happen. If their car broke down, if their cell phone went dead, if they got a flat tire, if there's been some unknown emergency and they just haven't been able to make known of it and you file a kidnapping report, you're the one that's going to end up losing custody. You're the one who could be end up being put on uh, supervised visitation. So what happened? 15 minutes after I gave that advice, the, children were, the child was dropped off. So even well-meaning people without the full context of a case, without the full context of working with family law on a regular basis, you can get bad advice. One parent who was not my client contacted me and they lost $3 million because of advice they took from friends to go back to court because there was a clause specific in their court order that prevented them from doing so. They went on the run for two years and they lost that $3 million. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I can't, that is, it's, it's mind blowing and a lot, and most parents don't have that amount of money to lose. Um, right, but $3 million is $3 million to somebody else. No matter what your income is, you know, the impact of $1,000, $10,000, you know, is huge. So they're, they're letting their emotions make their decision for them instead of really, um, I see you as someone who can get the, give them grounding in like in reality of, and also you're able to kind of see ahead and see what, the actions are today and how they will unfold in the future. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's about controlling what happens outside the courtroom just as much as it is about controlling what happens in the courtroom. And attorneys, they're, they're not there to give you dating advice. They're not really there to give parenting advice. They're really there. Their function is to protect you and your rights in court and to write the proper paperwork that protects you after court. But everything else 
happens outside of court. And that's where more damage can be done affecting your custody, your assets, everything, your future. So controlling what happens outside and then having the ability to communicate well with your attorney so that you're not sending them emails, you know, every time you get one, but only send them and communicate with your attorney when you need to, but also communicate well. And that's another aspect that most coaches, including myself, represent for the client. We, I saved my clients 15% over their uh, legal bills prior to working with me. Well, I can imagine, because for one thing, you're not emotionally attached to the situation. So, you know, unlike family members and, and all that, you're not diagnosing like a mental health counselor would. Um, you are, you're there to, to walk them, to navigate them through this, the, you know, and avoid the landmines. I can imagine that attorneys absolutely love having you on the team. Well, some really do and some don't because it's an extra set of eyes on a case. And I often frequently provide options for attorneys that they may not be aware of. So, you know, or haven't thought of because we all, we, we get so much information at this point, you know, when you've been doing it for as long as I have, sometimes you do forget some of the simpler ideas that you had initially. So I've actually been in the process of putting something together that will help parents better educate themselves before they even see an attorney so that they can avoid some of the, the learning curve, which is so detrimental because as you know, Danica, by the time parents figure out what they should have done or could have done, they're so far into the case and the damage is done. Some and many never recover. Absolutely. You know, I think that's, that was my godsend and in, in many years ago going through it is educating myself from the, the onset so that you don't have to clean up the messes and repair the emotional damage that, that you didn't mean to cause, but you just, you, you know, you find yourself in survival mode and you just do what it takes to survive at that moment. And it isn't until hindsight and the kids are grown, you're like, oh my gosh, I should have, I should have chosen something different. Well, even intact families go through that. The difference is that they don't have a court, they don't have counselors, they don't have parenting evaluators evaluating them. And another example I'll give is, as a police officer, when a child would run away from home, when I would find them, I'd say, hey, your parents get to choose the food you eat, the clothes you wear, the length of your hair. And when you turn 18, you're welcome to make all your decisions and you're living on your own. But until then, it's your parents' rights to make these decisions. Well, in family law, just the opposite is true, which is when alienators really encourage the children to run away from home. And what does family law do? They actually reward the alienator by saying, oh, if the child is running away from home, there must be a reason. We need to save this child. We need to rescue this child. And then they might put additional layers of therapy. They might put additional layers of counseling for you and the child. They might put uh, supervised visitation. They might even change custody for a while. And most parents, as you know, after years of this kind of aspect of life, they are victims of PTSD because they've been in their own war and they need someone to be that lifeline for them. Boy, that's the truth. A lot of time people don't really get that this is so traumatic for people who are who are going through this that they really do display post traumatic stress over it. And then from the, the outsider's view view that is not educated on how this all impacts them, they may see that and see the person as unstable and they're feeding into the story of the parent who's targeting. Well, that's why organizations like uh, Parental Alienation Study Group and Kids Need Both Parents, yours, uh, ISNAP, so many other organizations, too numerous to name PAAO, um, have really taken the forefront of trying to educate parents that court is not going to be, it's going to be counterintuitive. It's not like justice prevails. In fact, the famous saying is, don't ask for justice, you might just get it, because oftentimes the courts are getting these cases wrong. But, you know, there is a big push to improve the education. And I have to tell you, as a result of the internet, 
parents 20 and 30 years ago were truly victims and truly isolated, at least now with the internet and so many amazing grassroots organizations, there's some real hope. And where we never saw reunifications, now the good news is we are almost on a daily basis. And it's so exciting for someone like me that's been in here for as long as I have and for you and so many others. We get to see finally the, the, the labor coming to the fruition with parents being reunited again. Not soon enough, and we could do more to make sure it never even began, but until we get there, at least there's some hope for parents now. I know. I, that's the truth. I've seen this over, over the last 20 years or so, um, where you're just sort of a, a voice in the wilderness, and you have to educate um, everybody who comes along your path because they just don't understand it and and you know the word parental alienation does seem sort of alien uh to people so you have to educate them on what it means and what it looks like and stuff like that so um so yeah i'm super excited and that's one of the reasons that we have created the guardians and gatekeepers conference because it's an opportunity to, to give people what they need to um and it's through collaboration I am, I, I'm all about collaborating and pooling resources. And that's exactly what this is with all of the amazing speakers, including, including yourself who gracious, graciously accepted our invitation. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. And I love the title, Guardians uh -huh. and Gatekeepers. Well, thank you. Um, you know, we're just about running out of time. Uh, which I hate. I absolutely, I really <laughs> appreciate you coming in uh, and having this interview on Custody Matters Live. And, um, and I can't wait for you to, for us to have our conference. We're doing the conference. We, because of the world events, we shifted it from a live conference. You were going to fly all the way across country to come and speak, uh, which was so generous of you. And, um, and now you don't have to. We can have the conference and you get to uh, stay in California. So, oh, but you know, video is so nice if you don't have an alternative, but I like being in front of an audience. I like being able to answer the questions from the parents directly, but I'm literally looking forward to this opportunity. I hope everyone will join us for, you know, false child abuse allegations and epidemic in family law. Yes. You know, it's, it's actually, we've created, and I don't know if all of our viewers know this, but we're we're keeping the April conference and we're also creating a second conference that's live um, to rep um, in November. So we get to see you twice, which is actually perfect because there's different seasons of the year when, when parents, it seems like the, the uh, conflict seems to rise up uh, aside from the world events. A lot of times as we approach spring, spring break, Mother's Day, Father's Day, and then the other time of the year, November, we've got Thanksgiving and we have all of these holidays coming up and that actually causes a lot of um, conflict, which is perfect timing for them to hear what you have to offer. Well, I look forward to just providing information to parents who've really been victimized by the system. That's why I present on this topic, which I haven't done very often, actually. Well, thank you so much. And that's all we have here for Custody Matters Live. Uh, we have had a wonderful guest with Catherine McWilly of Custody Calculations. And, and we will see you again next, next week. Great, thanks so much.